medicine and uh, research. So, Dr. Hianossi. Thank you, Tassos, for the introduction, and uh, thank you uh, to the chair and to Tassos for inviting me. Uh, this is a, an area that uh, I'm most interested in, and I was kind of excited as I put together this talk, and I hope it generates some, some interest and excitement uh, from you as well. Um, I'll just briefly review the cardiopulmonary response to exercise. And then I really wanted to make this a clinical presentation so even uh, the non-physiologists in the audience will see that, you know, you can gain a lot of information from exercise testing. Uh, you can measure innumerable uh, physiological parameters during exercise. This is a graph from one of the standard textbooks, and I'll just run you through this quickly. On the very top is ventilation. And in an adult, and even in children, you will, we'll see kids who are breathing up to uh, 90, 100 liters per minute in the robust adolescence. Um, it initially goes up fairly linearly and then curvilinearly in heavy exercise. VCO2 is the volume of carbon dioxide produced during exercise, and VO2 is the volume of oxygen consumed to do the work. And VO2 goes up fairly linearly. It's closely related to the work done, assuming that your body metabolism is in good working order. The CO2 will go up more steeply in heavy exercise as excess uh, carbon dioxide is produced related to buffering lactic acid, and that's why you have to hyperventilate uh, as shown at the top, and uh, we already have a cursor problem, but okay. Um, end tidal CO2, PET CO2, uh, is the... Uh, is a, you want to monitor that during exercise because most patients will exhibit a hyperventilatory response and um, you can see there that end tidal CO2 does drop off in heavy exercise. We don't very often measure lactate but uh, we do occasionally and I have one case where it, that illustrates that. Uh, peak lactate values are not particularly helpful. They are somewhat age dependent. Um, uh, but uh, we don't measure them very often except in one particular circumstance. And of course, pH will drop very slowly initially and then more steeply toward the end of exercise as you develop your acidosis from heavy work. So what do we want to measure and why? Well, the main reason for doing an exercise test is you want to figure out, uh, calculate the peak oxygen uptake, VO2 peak or VO2 max in uh, uh, often called. Um, that's really the consummate test of, of the oxygen transport from the atmosphere to the exercising muscle. And we think in terms of the heart and the lungs mainly, but you also have to think in terms of the blood and the muscle itself, and specifically within the muscle, the mitochondria, and how effective they are as, uh, as uh, energy transducers. And the best ex way to think of them is think of your furnace in the home where they want you to have a high efficiency furnace that pretty much produces heat with 90-95% of the fuel that it burns as opposed to a lower efficiency. The mitochondria will work the same way. Now in the healthy child, uh, in prepubertal children, peak VO2 is similar in girls and boys, but once, and it's generally normalized for body weight because children are obviously of different size, we have to have some way of normalizing it. Now there's intense debate in the literature about what the best way to do that is. Nobody seems to agree, but most will simply reference it to body weight. Uh, as adolescence and puberty develops, then uh, boys can even grow a little bit, but they stay pretty constant, whereas in girls, the peak oxygen uptake in mils per kilo drops a little bit, mainly because of, well, we used to think because of increased body fat that comes with puberty, but, you know, recent studies have shown that, in fact, as Adolescent girls get older, they become less physically active, so that may or may not contribute. Now, being a pulmonologist, I'm obviously interested in measuring ventilation, so I have to walk you through a little bit of physiology here. You'll recognize on my left, the graph up here is the flow volume loop that you would commonly see when you send a child for spirometry. And this is determined from tidal breathing, in and out, in and out, and then they say take a big breath, or blow out all your air, so you exhale to RV, then take a big breath in, 
that's your vital capacity. You filled up the TLC, total lung capacity, and then they say blow out as hard and as fast as you can until your lungs are empty, back down to RV. So this would be a volume time graph, and here's the flow volume loop. And I want you to notice this is tidal breathing. Resting breathing occurs in the lower half, generally around 40% of your vital capacity, or I'm sorry, of your total lung capacity, between 40 and 50%. Now we can measure the same uh, during exercise, and this was described by Bruce Johnson um, while he was in Madison, but now he's at Mayo Clinic. Um, so what we have here is this is the maximum flow volume loop that I just showed you that you obtain in the pulmonary function lab. But you can measure a flow volume loop during exercise with every breath, and I'm going to actually show you some samples, and you... If you add the inspiratory limb, which is, whoops, we want to have another cursor, do we? Another uh, highlighter? Okay, all right. Um, if you measure the inspiratory limb, a big half egg down here, you define what's called the maximum flow volume envelope. So in theory, your ventilation cannot exceed the constraints imposed by the geometry uh, of your airways. And... Tidal volume is initially, you remember from the last graph, that rest, just the small fluctuations in this area here. But as you exercise, you have to take bigger breaths. So you increase on the x-axis from here to here, the horizontal, the horizontal axis. And you have to breathe more rapidly, so your flow rates have to increase. And as a result, you get greater displacement on the y-axis. And the height of these curves goes up. And that defines the flow volume envelope and the flow volume loop during exercise. And ultimately, what you want to determine is the volume of overlap between your exercise flow volume loop and your maximum flow volume envelope. And that is the new way to define ventilatory limitation to exercise. And this is actually an emerging concept. It's replacing the older concept. And we're, in fact, finding that <clears throat> many children seem to have flow limitation, but they don't have dyspnea. You can ask, but nobody knows the answer why. Now, why is all this important? All right, I have to show you some physiology, being a physiologist. So for those of you who don't remember, this is called the pressure volume uh, characteristics of the respiratory system. <clears throat> and FRC, where you're doing tidal breathing right now, sitting there, it's in here. When you exercise, you're going to increase your tidal volume, and you're going to increase it largely by going vertically up towards the one o'clock position of that graph. And you're going to choose that strategy because the slope of that heavy black line is called the compliance of the respiratory system. And the, the slope is maximal in here, so the compliance is maximum, meaning that your elastic work of breathing is at its lowest point as long as you stay along that line. If you breathe up near total lung capacity, it flattens out and all of a sudden you have to exert greater pressure on the x-axis to generate the same volume displacement. And similarly, if you breathe at low lung volumes, it's not very economical from the elastic point of view. However, you have to balance that with the resistive work of breathing. And the lung is very cleverly designed because <clears throat> those airways that course through the lung do not course through it in isolation. They are tethered to the surrounding lung parenchyma as shown in this graph or in this illustration. So as you expand your lungs and get up towards TLC, you're actually pulling open these small airways because as the lung expands, there's radial traction on the walls of those small airways that are opening it. So at higher lung volumes, you can achieve higher flow rates and your resistive work of breathing is, uh, is less. So this strategy of where you're gonna increase your tidal volume really address, tries to strike a balance between the elastic and the resistive loads to breathe. Ah, oh, wonderful, thank you. So much for the physiology. Now we're going to get into clinical medicine. And I can't give this talk without talking about that organ that is nestled between the lungs. It's, a, it's essentially a sump pump, for those of you who understand, who have houses. The heart will not pump anything it does not receive in the first place. Uh, and so it, if it doesn't get a preload, it's not going to do very much. Uh, I think it is essential to measure cardiac output during exercise. And um, there are several methods to do so. 
the standard method would be uh, with catheterization and measuring by the direct dick technique, impractical. It's been done in kids in the 60s in Scandinavia. Um, echocardiographic measurements are pretty good. They're difficult in the upright posture. I've done a study with them, and uh, they, they lend themselves best to supine exercise. The only problem with that is <clears throat> when you're supine, your stroke volume is already at a maximum or near maximum because at, when you're horizontal, the preload comes easy. It's uh, generating preload when you're upright uh, in the upright position becomes a challenge. So gas rebreathing methods have become fairly popular. I trained essentially in the carbon dioxide rebreathing method, but lately I think the acetylene rebreathing method is overtaking it. Uh, it measures pulmonary blood flow, which is going to be an index of cardiac or uh, uh, an indicator of cardiac output of the right ventricle, and it's actually pretty good. The only caveat with these rebreathing diseases is uh, rebreathing methods is in the presence of lung disease, where you don't have evenness of ventilation and perfusion, you can get some errors. So there's a pretty good relationship between cardiac output, abbreviated Q, and oxygen uptake. Um, this is just a graph from the Journal of Applied Physiology showing the FIC technique and two methods of uh, acetylene rebreathing. And generally, cardiac output increases by about 5 liters per minute for every liter per minute increase in oxygen uptake. It does so by a combination of more rapid heart rate, obviously, and also increasing stroke volume. Now, this is sort of a composite graph of what happens to stroke volume during exercise. The truth is there have been very few studies in children that have addressed this, uh, and um, there have been more studies in adults. Safe to say that the average population probably plateaus at about a third of maximum work capacity, and stroke volume remains unchanged. If you have a problem with your myocardium, maybe you uh, had uh, anthracyclines or something as part of chemotherapy, or if you have a failing myocardium for other, re for other reasons, you may in fact exhibit a, a fall in stroke volume as heart rate increases. And the highly trained individuals will, will actually increase their stroke volume uh, even in heavy exercise. Now, when I see an exercise test, and when you see an exercise test, there's a few questions you want to answer right off the bat. First of all, was it a maximal effort? Because you really want to stress the, the individual and make sure you're getting the best uh, work possible. And once you see the, uh, you determine it's a maximum effort, you decide, all right, is the peak oxygen uptake, which is a composite measure, uh, uh, normal or abnormal? And if it's abnormal, why? And Really, we are limited in our ability to make these calls by the techniques that we use for measurement. So if we don't measure cardiac output, we can make some inferences, but if we actually measure, we can be a little more definitive. So if it's abnormal, you have to ask yourself, is it a circulatory problem? Is it a ventilatory problem? And if it's neither of those, by default, it's a peripheral, meaning muscular problem. And that really remains the black box in exercise physiology, at least in the clinical sphere. There are research techniques that can probe this a little more. So here's an exercise test that I supervised in an in a elite tennis player, 16, 17, 16-year-old 16 year old male. Uh, so first thing is, was it a maximum effort? Well, we'd like to get the heart rate up to about 210 minus their age. So he should have been up in the 190s. He only got up to 174. And uh, I'm not sure that that was a maximum but he stopped because of leg fatigue. The other thing to judge maximum effort is this respiratory exchange ratio, which is the, uh, which is the quotient of VCO2, carbon dioxide uh, production, divided by VO2, oxygen uptake. And it, it really should be over one, except maybe in a seven-year-old, you might get them to one, and then they cut out. Uh, so his peak oxygen uptake was actually pretty good, 46 mils per kilo per minute, 106% predicted. You look, we talked about the heart rate already, good blood pressure response, that's, that's normal for a boy this, this size. Um, oxygen pulse, 24.3, very good. I mean, most kids are sort of in the teens, uh, and prepubertal kids can be in single digits. We look more in detail at cardiac output. Um, you can see his output at rest, 7.85, 30 watts, 14, 90 watts, 17, 150 watts, nearly 20. 
22.5, you're getting into the maximum cardiac output range in your average uh, robust adolescent. Nice stroke volume response, 106 mils, 160, 180, 177, 174. The, this is essentially unchanged um, within the limits. It's plus or minus 10%. If you look at his ventilatory response, he got up to 100 liters per minute. Um, the predicted maximum ventilation, not that he would ever achieve that, but what we consider the physiologic limit in this individual based on his FEV1 would have been 180 liters per minute. So he only uh, tapped into about 55% of uh, his maximum vent uh, voluntary ventilation. Most kids will get up to 70%. So between that and the heart rate, I'm not sure that that uh, he gave it his all, but he was being investigated for muscle fatigue. So uh, We also did blood gases, which we don't often do. 7.27, that's really not maximal. Most kids will get under 7.2 if you, if you can push them hard enough. Um, PCO2, he did not really manifest a hyperventilatory response. So you can see the graph of his ventilation here remains pretty linear. It doesn't curve up like in that initial graph that, that I showed you. So, and uh, they'll hyperventilate their PCO2 down into the 30s. Uh, PO2 fell a little bit, and this is, uh, this is seen in, in uh, elite athletes, and there's some debate what caused it, but you can get slight drops in your arterial PO2 even with healthy lungs. And a couple of other things, dead space to tidal volume. Your dead space is determined by your anatomic dead space, the, the conducting airways and the throat, and a little bit of physiologic dead space. That doesn't change very much with exercise, but because your tidal volume increases so much, the ratio of dead space to tidal volume goes from 40% at rest down to 15, 14 with exercise, which is normal. And his peak lactate was 7.9. He probably should have gone into double digits. But this essentially was a normal test. So let's get to the fun part of the presentation. Um, this was an 11-year-old girl who I saw with a history of asthma from uh, her toddler years. And uh, she had a methacholine challenge, and the diagnosis was confirmed a couple of years ago. Treatment was started with Singulair, still symptomatic, escalated to Flovan, eventually to Advair, because she just was short of breath. She was a competitive hockey player. So here are her pulmonary function tests. She probably has a little bit of obstruction even at rest. And I had been pushing her Advair doses up, and she was still complaining of shortness of breath. There's her flow volume loop. So we exercised her. She actually uh, got up to a heart rate of 192 and her R value 1.12. So I called it a maximal effort. We got her up to 40 mils per kilo. For an 11 year old girl, is actually pretty good. Um, and uh, the. Um, Ventilation here uh, got up to 58 liters per minute, and so she got up to 85% of her predicted maximum. So she, she pushed herself. Now, by conventional definition, we would say she was not ventilation limited because the conventional wisdom is that you don't consider somebody ventilation limited until they hit about 100%. But we did flow volume loops on exercise in her, and you can see rest. 30 watts, 80 watts. Her exercise flow volume loop is starting to touch her maximum flow volume envelope. And then she actually exceeds it at maximum exercise at 130 watts. And um, somebody can ask me later why that happens. It's a long story and I want to get through the talk, but it is possible. So the, the important, what I learned from this one is there's no point pushing up her ad bear from the 1 to 110 to the 220 to the, you know, it just wasn't making a difference. We tested her on the highest dose of ad bear, and she probably has some fixed airway obstruction due to remodeling from her long-standing asthma. We're just not going to make that better. I had to throw in this case for Tassos. Uh, so here's a 13-year-old boy, comes for a surgical evaluation. He's a little bit short of breath. You can see a CT scan. He's got a not a bad practice, really. I think his Holler index was not at near the level where you would uh, contemplate surgery anyways. But his spirometry shows what many kids with pectus have is a, a mild, well, we, we could debate if this, I would call it obstruction, but some might say he's even mildly restricted because his vital capacity was only 81%. Here's his exercise test results. Uh, we got him up to uh, 63 liters a minute. 
Uh, so 68% predicted uh, of his maximum voluntary ventilation. Again, you would not consider him ventilation limited uh, by, those, uh, by those measures alone. But yet, when you measured his flow volume loop, uh, he clearly uh, was uh, overlapping his maximum flow volume envelope at 120 watts, so about you know, two-thirds of the way through, and overlapping even more at 180 watts. And he stopped uh, exercising, as many kids with pectus do, because he was short of breath. So does this mean that all kids with pectus have this? We don't know. I mean, th this was just one uh, isolated uh, child that I investigated and presented. All right, so this is a common question, I'm sure, in most pediatric hospitals. Is it the heart or is it the lungs? This was an 11-year-old boy with congenital pulmonary valve stenosis who had been followed regularly for, with echocardiograms. And his maximum gradient across the pulmonic valve was 36 to 40 millimeters of mercury. But the echocardiographer who did the study commented that, you know, the valve looks abnormal. It domes during systole. Uh, and he was suspecting that, you know, there's more to this than just that gradient. So this boy was 11, but in the last year or so, he had begun to experience chest pain and shortness of breath with exertion. And he would complain that he felt the pounding in his chest. He'd stop, rest, and the pain would go away. So here's verbatim from the echocardiographic report. Mild degree of RVH, ejection jet through the valve was quite restrictive, suggesting more significant stenosis. Oh, yes, I threw up this because he's got pretty good pulmonary size pulmonary artery there, too. I wouldn't say it compressed that bronchus necessarily, but it's a decent sized pulmonary artery. Here are this boy's pulmonary function tests. Uh, so he actually looks a little bit obstructed, and he's a scoop there. Um, and uh, yeah, this was uh, after the exercise test. He, he only fell 3%, so I didn't think he had exercise induced bronchospasm. Um, here is his exercise test result. Got his heart rate up to 192. His R value only 0.94, so I'm not even sure that this was a maximum effort. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's rest. There it is, 1.15. So it was a maximum effort. Good heart rate, good R value. Peak oxygen uptake for an 11-year-old boy, though, is low at 32 mils per kilo per minute. Only 73% of predicted. Again, ventilation got up to 46 liters a minute. So 64% pre uh, predicted, so we would not consider him ventilation limited. But yet, when we tested him, he in fact, like the last two kids, showed significant expiratory flow limitation and heavy exercise. Now this is interesting because there's an old paper in the, in the cardiology literature that says that kids with congenital pulmonic stenosis, well even adults, if they don't have it fixed, actually do have a degree of lung hypoplasia um, because the lung needs a good blood supply going through it to stimulate growth. And I don't remember how his vital capacity was. I was decent, 92% predicted. But um, so my point here is that in this boy, I'm actually not sure if it was the heart or the lungs that was restricting him. The cardiologist dilated his valve uh, on the cath in the cath lab, anyways. But um, our ability, I think, to make these calls is is really determined by what we can measure and what we what we seek to measure. So. Mayo Clinic, we see a lot of these teenagers that are always tired and they have no energy. I'm sure you see them here and when they stand up, they get dizzy. And uh, that's called POTS or for postural ortho orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. Some people feel it's simply the result of deconditioning because the, the best model for this disorder seems to be either prolonged bed rest or space flight. It does the same thing to you. Um, but she would complain of blackout spells and chest pain. And the chest pain she describes as, as I said there, um, and she also had a vague history of pulmonary problems in the past, maybe some wheezing with soccer that was relieved with albuterol, but she was never diagnosed as having asthma. Uh, spirometry looks great, uh, no significant change following exercise, nice normal flow volume loop. So here's her exercise test, we've gone through several formats, but anyways, her uh, Heart rate at peak exercise was 210, so we got a good effort out of her. Her R value, 1.12, but peak oxygen uptake was low, only 30 mils per kilo. You can see a graph of heart rate versus VO2 there. She starts high around 100, and she quickly gets up to 200. Um, ventilation seems appropriate, linear in the beginning. There's that hyperventilatory response in heavy exercise. 
Um, her end tidal CO2s went from 36, 38, 39 down to 32. But here's the thing with her. Her stroke volume really didn't go up much at all. And in fact, for a girl who's, uh, her body surface area is uh, there, 1.6 meters squared. This is, this is a pitsy stroke volume. And even though it increased maybe 50%, uh, it's still a pitsy stroke volume. And so this is classical deconditioning, poor stroke volume response, high heart rate, and, uh, and this stroke was in fact the real, uh, real deal with POTS because about two-thirds of them, almost three-quarters of them are deconditioned. So that's um, an, uh, an overview basically of how, uh, what exercise physiology has told us uh, up until recently. Um, there are still new emerging concepts. I mentioned this uh, tidal flow volume loops. It, there's been two publications, one from France and one from the U.S., that say that uh, young children, you know, the 10, 11, 12-year-olds, uh, actually do seem to reach flow limitation at exercise, and nobody really seems to have a handle on that yet, uh, why that might be, but they don't complain of dyspnea. But there are some emerging concepts, and I remember I was at the pediatric work physiology meeting in 2005, and, and I first heard of this, and I scratched my head and said, what? But let me tell you about it. Um, the larynx really is the bottleneck, uh, literally and figuratively, uh, of the airway in the exercising uh, child and, and adult. And so just to review the laryngeal anatomy, anterior here with your epiglottis, there are the vocal, the true cords. Um, and uh, posteriorly, you have your arytenoid cartilages, et cetera, et cetera. And the vocal cords would normally open up nicely during exercise, during inhalation, to allow maximum inspiratory flow. They might narrow during exhalation, probably during tidal breathing they do, but not so much during exercise. Um, and, uh, and uh, of course, you have your false cords out there, too. So, now... This is another case of a 16-year-old girl uh, with four years of recurring episodes of difficulty breathing and upper sternal discomfort, some shooting pains in this area. Now, when you, I always ask the kids what it feels like when they're, when they're short of breath because uh, you can get a, a clue as to what's going on by the words they choose. Um, and she said it feels like she can't get enough air in. This consistently occurred 10 to 15 minutes into vigorous running and resolved after several minutes of rest. She had uh, undergone interval runs on a treadmill at another institution. After the third run, felt this shortness of breath and even developed mild strider there. So what they did was uh, flexible laryngoscopy immediately afterwards. And they, the comment was, I never saw a video, but the, the vocal folds moved normally, but the uh, arytenoids prolapsed a little bit over the glottis. So here's a, not the same girl. Oh, no, this is the same girl. Here's her exercise test in our lab. Uh, heart rate, 194. R value, 1.2. Good effort. Peak oxygen uptake, 38.5 mils per kilo, which is good for a 16-year-old girl, 112% predicted. Ventilation, she got close to her true limit. And we see that with the flow volume loops in the necks, uh, but not so much on the inspiratory, on the expiratory limb. She had plenty of room there. She had it on the inspiratory limb, and her inspiratory limb was pretty reproducible with this more triangular as opposed to a half egg shape. And she was reaching inspiratory flow limitation. Now this video is from a, is from a different girl, but this is what it would look like. Keep your momentum now. This is where you don't want to let the bike get you because if you slow down, it'll really get hard. There you go. Keep it a little bit about somebody if you need to. Don't let it slow down. Go, go, go. Not everyone with Strider is in a full Push it, push it, push it. Get that speed up a little bit. Get that blood pressure again here in just a little bit. But keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Go, 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 go. 
Yeah, go, go, go. Go, 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 go. Push, 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 push. Get mad at it. Get mad at it. Get mad at it. Get mad at it. Go, 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 go. Take that for you. Yep, you can take that. So Just so, yep, you'll need that. You can oh, grab that. You keep it. Okay, good job. Good job. Now I want you to pedal 30, like I said. Nice and slow now. Okay. Nice and out. easy. And the NT dog can do something about that. Yeah, it's bad of it. But the speed language is all you can. They'll help All right, so this is another one. Um, a uh, 17-year-old uh, boy, I think from Michigan. He was an elite cross-country skier, uh, so in the cold weather, too. Complaining of shortness of breath. Yeah, about three months before I saw him, he had a flu-like illness. And he tried to resume competition, being a go-getter, too soon. And he really just didn't have it anymore when it came to his breathing. So he was diagnosed as having exercise induced bronchospasm and treated with the usual escalation, but nothing seemed to help. He was still short of breath. Then about a month before I saw him, he started making a loud inspiratory noise. And so they thought appropriately, uh, locally, that, okay, this could be vocal cord dysfunction. He had seen a speech language pathologist, had some therapy, but still felt short of breath. He wasn't stridus, but still short of breath. He was, went to junior nationals, just couldn't uh, perform up to par. So this guy's got huge lungs. Uh, everything's like 100%, well, at least the, the dynamic volumes anyways. Uh, huge flow volume loops. A nice inspiratory limb there. So this looks great. Uh, here's his exercise test. Uh, 52 mils per kilo. Don't see that very often, so 113% predicted, but there's kids out there that do it. I jumped ahead. Heart rate was only 183, but that's our value was pretty good, so I thought this was a maximal effort. I supervised it, so I knew. Ventilation got up to 75% of predicted maximum ventilation, 177 liters per minute. Um, now, his exercise test was really interesting. And, you know, you, you're always learning in your career. Don't, don't ever forget that. And be open to new concepts. Here are his um, uh, graphs. Ventilation goes up curvilinearly, as you see. Heart rate went up uh, not as steeply as I might have thought because he's in such good shape. He had a little bit of uh, overlap there. Um, people, how much is normal is hard to see. 25% we don't, we don't consider abnormal. When it gets up to 40%, maybe. But his issue was not so much the flow volume envelope as it was his pattern of breathing. And I want, you to, I want to draw your attention to this composite uh, uh, graph here. So these are all the flow volume loops at different stages during exercise. Remember when I said uh, you increase your ventilation by enlarging tidal volume and, and respiratory rate, and you want to do it at an optimum operating lung volume to balance the elastic and the resistive load. So you don't, don't want to breathe up a TLC because it's too hard, like inflating a balloon that's nearly full. You can blow all you want, but you're not going to get much expansion. And you don't want to go down too low lung volumes because then your airways are small and you won't get high flow rates. So this guy was breathing literally all over the place. You'd watch him during exercise, and he would breath stack, and, uh, and his shoulders would become hunched. And so if you try and plot, and it w when we exercise, we watch each breath. And this guy was literally dancing all over the place. His end expiratory lung volume, so where he initiated each breath, seemed to rise progressively by three, four, five hundred mils uh, uh, in, in the span of 30 seconds, and, and just... He would keep shifting that lung volume instead of operating at a nice uh, economical uh, breathing strategy. And that was really the source of his dyspnea, was he was recruiting the wrong uh, respiratory muscles the whole time. So this is the final video clip. I wanted to show you some true, uh, this is a different patient. Um, and uh, here's a, one that I just saw recently. and. I have to listen carefully because the volume isn't as loud as this one. Um, and the, the placement of the probe wasn't as good, but I'll point it out to you. It comes with a diagnosis of asthma, still short.
short of breath. Somebody had been really hammering away with the needles here at the Kentucky side a little bit of the brush layer. You probably see some white black side down there. So, epiglottis. What was the cursor? Yeah, Anna, you're doing great. Epiglottis. Yeah. Arotenoid, there's one, there's the other. You're not really prolapsing. The vocal cords that she just followed there, that's Bill, Bill. Okay, that's fine. That was the, um, the inspiratory maneuver. We have to tell the computer program every once in a while where between our P and the the child is breathing. So we say to them, okay, take a big breath in. We want them to fill up their lungs in the computer system. Okay, that's my reference point. That's total lung capacity. And all subsequent breaths are placed appropriately on the X axis. So her vocal okay. cords aren't as wide open okay. as the other. Over, Anna, we're going to do do blood pressure. You're doing great. Keep your lips tight for me. But she's staring them a little bit on that. I talk too much. <laughs> Did you hear right at the end? It's a short one. So watch what she does with the cords. And listen. Good job. That's what exercise does. Or monitoring your breath on the screen. Good job, Anna. You're doing great. Oh, we're going to place that nice job. horizontal axis. Right. The next breath, I want you to take the B1 food. Fill it up. Fill it up. Fill that's that formal, by the way, but... No. Now listen. Good job. You're doing great. You're doing great. Keep it going here now. In about 10 seconds, you've got another change coming. It's going to get harder to pedal. There you go. So you see those cords narrow and now she's trying to inhale against them essentially a block there. Now she started to cry. She started to cry. I'm, not, I'm not a mean person, but you have to push these kids. No, well, you got to replicate. It's kind of dumb when they get off the bike and they, I, I didn't work hard enough. That's why I didn't get sympathetic. Take that out of your mouth and just relax. Now she's crying. Okay, so so this is this is a, an, an emerging field, and I'm, I'm telling you, it's be, it's to become invaluable. And uh, and if you have, I ha I'm fortunate enough that one of the speech language pathologists that I work with is uh, is a singer um, as well, and so she's the one who taught me uh, about watching the breathing movements and and seeing what respiratory muscles they're using with that 17 year old cross country skier it, you know that that's where I really was able to apply those lessons so now in the closing uh, few slides I want to tell you about some work I've done because remember at the beginning I said uh, if it's abnormal is it the heart of the lungs and if it's not it's we think it's the muscles and that's what remains a black box well we hope to explore that a little, a little bit more so it's just a schematic illustration of the mitochondria that you're all familiar with you have your fuels enter all these complicated biochemical pathways and then you have uh, um, the, the uh, respiratory um, electron transport chain that generates the most ATP much more effectively than uh, than anaerobic metabolism but what happens is uh, is once you uh, start to burn your glucose you get it down to pyruvate and pyruvate would normally enter into this cycle here but if there's enzymes blocking this somewhere downstream then pyruvate cannot enter this cycle and it gets preferentially shunted to lactate and this is what happens in a class of disorders called mitochondrial diseases and these patients have obvious neurologic well sometimes obvious neurologic manifestations sometimes they're more subtle and it's been known for a, a while that, that they'll generate lactic they have higher lactic acids often at rest uh, it's certainly with exercise and there's a, a 
Yeah, it's actually quite a debate in the literature between two groups of adult uh, neurologists, one in Austria, one in Denmark, that's saying that exercise testing is useful in these kids. But here's where the pediatricians have one up on the on the adult uh, on the adult types. They've all um, looked at lactate levels at a given workload and and said and found that there's a lot of overlap between the, the mitochondrial patients and controls, and there often is with deconditioned individuals, especially. But being a pediatrician, I said, I'm not going to plot them against workload. I'm going to plot them against oxygen consumption, which is really the measure of what's happening at the level of the mitochondria. And it takes into account the fact uh, uh, that kids of different size will have different uh, oxygen consumptions. So here are a group of patients with uh, known mitochondrial diseases that we study. Um, I won't take you through all this, but uh, many of them had ocular symptoms, ophthalmoplegia a little bit of optic atrophy. Uh, some, we knew what the genetic defect was. Some, we didn't know quite what it was in there. But, but they were pretty much mitochondrial uh, disorders. The one girl in particular, this 10-year-old female, she was, the most, uh, she was the most mildly affected of the group. And there is this thing, uh, this thing, issue called heteroplasmy, where depending on how much of the mitochondrial DNA is abnormal, uh, you can have very mild or more severe manifestations. So anyways, what we did is we devised an exercise protocol where all the kids with the mitochondrial disorders came in, did a maximal test to figure out their peak uh, work capacity. Then I brought them back on another day and exercised them for six minutes at one-third and then two-thirds of their maximum and measured lactate at rest after one-third maximum, after two-thirds maximum, and then after a 20-minute recovery. And I can boil it down to this graph here, where we plotted their lactate levels versus their oxygen uptake, not against their workload, because their workloads were all different because they were children of different sizes. Um, now, the, the dots, the blue dots are healthy controls. The red squares are the mitochondrial patients. And the green, which was my second control group, these are children with muscle weakness from other causes. I had two at Duchenne, uh, one with limb girdle uh, muscular dystrophy, one with, I um, uh, can't remember if it was myofibular or mini core myopathy. But uh, the upshot is that uh, you can pretty much, once you plot the lactate levels against VO2, which is the true metabolic cost to the child, they separate out quite nicely. This is a 10-year-old girl who she's got some overlap with some deconditioned controls, uh, but uh, with something called discriminant analysis, which basically uh, looks at the groups, draws a line through them, and then measures the perpendicular distance to the line and decides which point is closest to which line. We correctly identified all of these and all of these. The only error was that some deconditioned controls were uh, incorrectly identified as mitochondrial patients. And so this was just in one center. Now we want to replicate in the center like Mayo Clinic where we see many more of these patients. And uh, I'm, I'm, But just to, to, to show you that uh, I started off as a pulmonologist, did all the lung stuff on exercise, realized that, okay, that sump pump is important too, measured cardiac outputs, learned about that, and now I want to tackle the final frontier, and that's, that's the, the peripheral, the muscular factors to try and understand why some kids are limited. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention. I'm a major hockey fan, so I have to throw up a capital slide. And I'm happy to entertain questions. Do we have any questions or comments? We have a microphone right there. Here we go. Thanks. It was a most interesting uh, lecture. Um, <clears throat> so it, it appears that you could use uh, this methodology <clears throat> from a therapeutic point of view, not only for medications, but also um, from a, a, a speech and language uh, perspective. So, um, and, you know, teaching uh, children how to breathe better, yes, their absolutely. posture, things like that. So do you frequently uh, do that uh, be kind of before and after, not just with medication, but with uh, especially with uh, the kids who may have uh, uh, metabolic disorders and uh, other causes? I, I have it myself. There are one or two publications that look at the effects of certain medications on lactate metabolism in this uh, population. Um, 
I've argued that uh, measuring peak oxygen uptake should be a therapeutic outcome uh, in, in other diseases, uh, notably cystic fibrosis. I mean, in fact, I think uh, I was the only one who published a longitudinal uh, out, uh, data on VO2 and peak VO2 in children with CF. We know it's related to mortality, but the question is how rapidly does it decline? And the thought was that if you can uh, slow that decline with some treatment, you've made inroads. So I do think it can be used to assess the effects of therapy uh, as an outcome measure. It hasn't been widely employed yet, I think for two reasons. One is that there's anybody can do an exercise test, but there's not many people who, who really um, appreciate, you know, the, the, the nuances. And secondly, um, it's, uh, it's relatively easy. It's non-invasive. But it is a costly uh, uh, venture, so I don't think it's caught on, but um, it should. I think the pectus population is a great one to, to do it uh, before and after. Try to get the insurance companies to pay for the test before. That's even a problem, let alone after. Yeah, Paolo, thank you very much. Actually, following on the same lines, uh, for kids like the ones you showed us on the videos, you know, that you document this vocal cord, Dysfunction, whatever yeah. ways you know to call it. What is the next step? Uh, because a lot of times, you know, this is either we suspect that this is the problem, or in your case, you document that this is the problem. Where do you move? So uh, I think the, the this is where the the direct la uh, sorry flexible laryngoscopy has been indispensable because if it's an arytenoid issue and the area epiglottic folds are redundant, what the NT surgeons will do is they'll laser them cause a little bit of scarring and then they become a little more taut and they're less likely to prolapse in. If it's vocal cord, uh, this true vocal cord, paradoxical vocal fold movement, you really only have one, maybe two options. And one is intense work with the speech language pathologist. We had one girl who had a true laryngeal dystonia and with her they gave Botox injections to keep the, to keep the vocal cords abducted. Um, I don't know what you do with the false cord prolapse. I've only seen one so in 15 years. So, um, so. All right. Look, thanks very much. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Thank you.